The sacramental worldview will blow your mind. Uh, this is a uniquely Catholic, Orthodox thing to be thinking about. Uh, for me, as an evangelical Christian, this was nowhere on my map at all. If you had said sacraments to me, I would have said, sacra what? I had no idea. But living out the Catholic sacramental worldview is really a life-changing experience. It changes the kind of oxygen you breathe as you live your life, how you orient all even menial, tiny little tasks to the great big ones are oriented in a different way as you live out a sacramental world view. I am joined this week by Father Harrison Eyre to talk about what it means to have a sacramental worldview, how to live that out, how the church can help us and, and helps us, how to, uh, how to really em- embrace and lean into the Catholic sacramental worldview. I think it'll blow your mind. It's a fantastic conversation. Please enjoy. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. If you are watching on YouTube, welcome. Please hit the subscribe button and like this video and, and, and share it around if you can, if you do like it. And uh, if you're listening on podcast, hello, thanks for listening. And we're also on YouTube at youtube.com slash the cordial Catholic. Uh, this week, we have a fantastic conversation for you. I am joined by Father Harrison Eyre. He is a priest in the uh, Diocese of Victoria up here in Canada. He's a pastor of St. Peter's Parish, the co-host of the Clerically Speaking podcast. I'm sure you've heard of them. And the author of a fantastic new book called Mysterion, the Revelatory Power of the Sacramental Worldview from Pauline Press. The fantastic Pauline sisters put this book out uh, and it's beautiful. Welcome to the show, Father. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be with a fellow Canadian. It I, is. I, there's too much American <laughs> Catholicism out there. We need more Canadian Catholicism. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Spicy yeah. from the start. I love it. Uh, Father, this is a fantastic yeah. book. Um, Thank you. And I got to say, like, so one of the, the normal courses of, of having people on, on this show is when a book comes out, I get emails from different uh, from different uh, pub, public what they call from di- publishers <laughs> i get emails from different publishers uh saying hey i got this author check this book out and about half of those are, are ones that fit well on the show and so i say sure i'll, I'll try it out but two-thirds of those books that i that i get and i read are like yeah they, that's a good fit and i have had them on the show in your case i i was i was tracking them down like a hawk mm-hmm. <laughs> father <laughs> i came to i came to banging on your door and banging yeah. on the sister's door to to get you on this show because I've been following you for a while on, on social media and your podcast and I knew this book was was you're working on this book and this is such a fantastic topic for for this show for for Catholics uh, in particular who are who are or, or Christians who are looking into the Catholic faith new mm-hmm. Catholics who the audience of this show uh, primarily this is such a fantastic topic and so I hunted you down to get, to get you on the show so I'm glad that you're here I'm glad to be here and it's like and I well I think was I did I tell you I'm like make sure to take off the dust jacket <laughs> because like for me it's it's just it, it's 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 a book you want to have just for just to look at the art just to look at the art well it's a it's a, that's one thing that's a whole other yeah. thing here it's a beautiful yeah. book it looks fantastic i got it in the mail and i left i put it on the shelf in in our living room for a bit just i kind of put it down there standing up mm-hmm. And I uh, got a picture and posted it, and I left it there for like two weeks. I didn't I didn't read it right, right away. I think mean, that's bad to admit, but just looked at it for like two weeks. It was just mm-hmm. gorgeous to look at. Look mm-hmm. at it up there in the, in the twinkly mm-hmm. Christmas lights we had up on our, mm-hmm. on our our shelf there. But then yeah. you actually open the book. Yeah, and it's, it's the content is pretty good too. Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's been, yeah, it's, it's been it's been a fun project because. Um, one thing I've been saying to a few people is how I, you know, when I wrote like the little kind of, you always have to write a little sample when you're wanting to get a book published. And, and this was really the fruit of a conversation between Sister Teresa, Alethea, and I. And, and, and th- this is how the kind of the book idea came together. And then I sent it to her and they said they'll do it. And then I saw, and then the, Sister Teresa said to me, Father Harrison, your book is so Pauline. And I was like, what? She goes, Everything you're talking about, that's our charism. That's everything in our spirituality. <laughs> so the book has been just this wonderful fruit of a shared charism. Like in in their community, I've discovered the charism, I think, that I'm supposed to live out in my das and priesthood, right? So it's just been 
it's it's definitely been one of those god projects you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely and they do they do love it i mean they, they produced it but also i i put it on on twitter i think and there was like 10 million uh retweets from the pauline sisters all over the yeah. world who, who <laughs> laughed on them. yeah yeah i love this book is great <laughs> so they have a fantastic like you know media base to promote your fantastic mm -hmm. work but it is it's a wonderful project and i want to dig into i'm going to ask you a, a huge question here to start with and the question mm -hmm. is going to be what is the sacramental worldview we can we spend yeah. an hour just talking about that, but I want to frame mm -hmm. it for you a little bit in context here because, you know, I'm a I'm an evangelical convert to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. and a lot of listeners to this show are are looking into the Catholic faith or are new Catholics from a similar background to that. And for me, this idea of the sacraments was just so foreign to me as mm -hmm. a non-Catholic Christian. I can think of. I was on a jour this journey, reading my way into mm -hmm. the Catholic faith primarily, and I had a really good close friend who also was reading along with me for for a large part of it. And he says to me one day, he goes, I don't, you know, this stuff seems good, it seems right and true, but I don't know if I could do a sacramental life. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, what's a sacrament? <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, I had read... <laughs> I had read quite a bit so far. Yeah. You know, I, I had a lot of book learning at that mm -hmm. point. I hadn't experienced Catholicism yet. But to me, the idea of a sacrament was just was that foreign. I didn't know what it what it was, right? Mm -hmm. So so we in my context, you know, in the Pentecostal church, in the non denominational evangelical church, we would our, our Christian life would consist of you know, going to church on Sunday, sometimes uh, a Bible study as well. You know, we dig into the mm -hmm. Word, we'd, we'd sing worship songs on a Sunday, mm -hmm. we communion kind of once a month, and it was a yeah. symbolic yeah. kind of thing. Maybe and, bring your coffee cup into yeah, church, yeah, you know? It would, it would, <laughs> yeah, it would, yeah, we would, which yeah. seems so yeah. crazy. Now. <laughs> and, you know, and, and the main the main focus of, of a service for for us was the the preaching, right? Mm -hmm. Which was taking something from scripture and expounding it for us to apply into our lives. And then we'd mm -hmm. go out, we'd go out, after after church and try and live out that that calling like live yeah. as somebody who's becoming more like christ who's loving our neighbor loving uh you know our our, our enemy love you know, act, act, doing acts of charity reading our scriptures praying like it, it was central you know christ was central to our mm -hmm. lives and we were you know very devout non-catholic christians but it's such a different worldview to you know, when we my wife and I became Catholic and began to understand the sacramental worldview, it's it's to me, to my mind, so fundamentally different way of living mm -hmm. as a Christian that 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 this for a long time for me has been a topic I want to tackle on the show because it's so it's so huge and important. And so when you were working on this book, I thought this is the guy I have to get him on. <laughs> so I want to ask you that question yeah. to start with, and we we can go yeah. yep. anywhere here with this. This is this is a right. big, a big topic. This is. He, what and what it, what is the sacramental worldview, Father? And just and just quickly, like I think what you're talking about with your experience there, it, it's really like you're breathing different air, right? Like it's just it, it's it's a it's a totally different yeah. ecosystem. It, yeah. it's, a, it's a different ecology, right? It's yeah. just a it's a totally different universe. So to put it simply and, and and kind of pithily, I would say that the sacramental worldview recognizes that God communicates Himself to us primarily through His material created world. And that the material can make present and manifest the spiritual, and that they're not in opposition with each other, but that they're in a deep communion with one another. And so it's it's based in this truth that God took on our humanity. And our humanity means that God took on the whole of creation, which means that God's creation, even though it's fallen, and and yes, sometimes that that fallen creation uh, and and the realm of sin can actually interfere with coming to know God. At the fundamental heart of it, it's to say God actually came and took on our creation in Christ so as to draw all of it up into him. And, and so it, it helps us to see that everything we do and are, like really it's supposed to say like at the heart of Christianity, I would argue, is sacramentality. It is the way of being it, it, because then if I can encounter and know God through his creation in different ways and like there is kind of the more – philosophical like yes god is known through nature etc like romans one and two what, what paul makes the argument for right that we could have known god through it was possible to know god through our reason but a lot of people didn't anyway still um but that also for the christian through baptism now everything that the church has and is is a means by which i participate in the life of christ and christ participates in my life and I don't, and I mean that in like the deepest sense possible, the word participation. <laughs> like I always like to say, 
I am in Christ, one of Paul's favorite phrases, yeah. more than I'm in my rectory right now. That that being in Christ through baptism is the deepest reality of being a Christian. And therefore, there is a deep connection in my humanity, in my life, in my action, with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. <laughs> You know, I read that and I read that in in your book. You talk about the idea of being in Christ and you you give a very similar analogy. Not not in your, I'm not mm -hmm. in your rectory, but you know, yeah. in, in the car or wherever you're. Yeah. And that, you know, I've I've signed in Christ in my in my emails since I was the evangelical Christian. I, yeah. I, you know, because I'm I'm a member of the body of Christ. I, yep. I saw that even even then in a different way than I see it now. But and so yeah, I'm 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 in Christ. But to actually just sit in that for a moment and realize in the sacramental worldview of things, we really are participating in the in the life of Christ in a yeah. <laughs> like you yeah, say, I know like, like it, it, the reality is more real than where where we both are now. And, and, and it's, it, it really, would, it, it's funny because like we're both tripping over words to describe the reality <laughs> because we know it's true. There's like a deepness to it. Then there's a, there's a weightiness to that fact, <laughs> but words almost fail now at this point. It makes sense, but it's hard to say anything more because it's just, it's so much more than that. And it, and the, at the heart of that, then that means that because I think one of the things a lot of Christians have, uh, or at least a lot of Catholics too, like um, this idea, like we treat Jesus as a historical figure who was only active in the past, someone who who kind of lived two thousand years ago. That was great. He then because then all he becomes is just an example to live by. Yeah. But the sacramental worldview says no. Um, the life, mis the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is now because of. He's also not just son of man, but son of God. Everything about Jesus's life is lifted up into the eternal love of the Trinity. And therefore, we have access to everything of Jesus's life today. And we can encounter him in that mysterious way through the sacraments, through the church, through all these other avenues within the life of the church and living out our Christian faith. I have access to those mysteries. Like, like it's, it's why we had the liturgical year and all this stuff, right? We're about to go into to Lent here, right? Like we're entering into the desert with Jesus. And this is not just some poetic sense. No, we, we are, we're going, we're heading 40 days into the desert. And, and, uh, and that's not just some nice poetry and like, Oh yes, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to enter into that personal self. Just like Jesus did. No, no, Jesus is actually entering into the desert with us and with his church and the church with him. And so, it's just kind of constant recognition. Like I have access to this. Like, and so he's not some distant figure of the past. He's present today, really. And truly. And I, I, I'm just like, every time I don't know my pastoral life, I feel like we, we don't recognize this. Uh, I think we haven't formed Christians in general to perceive this reality. And it's also like, so biblical, right? Because it's so at the heart of Paul, like, because in, in the Greek there, it's not, it's not like just like, oh, I'm in his name, like, like, a, like it, no, it, it's, it's deeper. It's, it's participation. It's, it's your being in the being of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess the thing that struck me when I began looking into this and then living this out as, as a Catholic is yeah. just how deep these roots are. Like, I mean, I think it's fair to say, and I, I had Dr. Lawrence Feingold in the show a while back, actually, embarrassingly mm -hmm. a long while back it was like episode 13 of the show and i was like mm -hmm. had no idea what i was doing back then but i, I thought I'd, i'll just try i love this guy i want to have him and uh, it's embarrassing to listen to it in, in hindsight but <laughs> we talked about this idea of just like this is how god has always worked even in the old yeah, testament exactly. we see echoes of that sacramentality and uh, gosh how foolish i, I, I I shouldn't say foolish because there are lots of Christians out there who are, I guess, are foolish if, if I lumped them in this category. But how foolish I was not to see that sooner. That, mm -hmm. that you know, I, and it feels frustrating that I, for a while, spent time trying to piece together my faith as an evangelical, trying to listen to a sermon and live it out, rather than recognize that, look, these things were meant to be tangible. Like you're missing the tangible parts of how God has always worked yeah. if you kind of negate the sacraments. But it is it is how God has always worked, like even in the Old Testament, right? It's a sacramental system of faith. It, it really is. I mean, you look at even the way God makes his salvation known to Israel, it's through a burning bush, right? Yeah, it's yes. through the parting of the Red Sea. God always, it's through the authority of Moses. 
God always works like this. I think, and I, I mean, we could talk about this maybe a little bit later about like mediation and mo- modernism, because like the at the heart of it is this notion that God works through things, and this is the primary way God works. It's it's because He wants to work in concert with His creation, right? Like one image that kind of pops in my mind around that is even after the fall, God goes in searching for Adam and Eve, right? Because He the whole point was to work in a great communion and concert with creation. And it's not God who distance, like, yes, God kind of has to distance itself too for a reason because of the fall, but it's really more us who distanced ourselves from God. And, and so, but over and over and over again, every story of the old Testament or even, even the creation of Adam and Eve, like how does Adam know the fullness of humanity by he, Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, seeing, right? So it's it's something tangible because if we deny sacramentality, we deny something essential to being human. Like one of the analogies I like to use a lot that I know I used in the book is words, right? Words are sacraments, right? You don't, you can't, you can't read my mind, right? Oh, maybe you can, but I don't know. <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> no, no, but, uh, you know, you can't read my mind, you it's, so there's something invisible. There's these ideas that just are percolating there. But I say some words, you know, sound waves travel and, and our eardrums pick the, up those vibrations and then we're able to process and hear that. And then there's a communication is able to happen because I'm able to communicate something hidden and reveal it to you. And then you're able to receive that and process that and we're able to understand each other. That's the heart of sacramentality. Like God, it's, it's about recognizing this is how God's built us. He has built us this way. And so when we deny sacramentality in Christianity, I really think we deny the heart of our humanity. <laughs> and I think in, in some ways, uh, I think that is part of the modern experience. I actually think we, we, we deny our sacramentality and our experience of it daily not recognizing just how important it is like 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 things like the rhythm of a week and everything we've lost a lot of this because but those are we need those things to be human it's saying our embodiedness matters and it's actually something dignified that god has embraced and lifted up yeah, I think one of the, the the huge revelations I'm thinking just I teach mm-hmm. the, the the course for people becoming coming Catholic adults becoming mm-hmm. Catholic at, at our parish and we just did the confession week and mm-hmm. I, I'm just thinking of of gosh the the it's very visceral like the feeling of when you you realize that this faith was meant to be physical and tangible you, you realize that when you come into a faith that wasn't that way right so mm-hmm. as a non-catholic i don't want to keep beating this drum but as a non-catholic christian i would have say prayed in my bedroom kneeling in my bed and asked yeah. god to forgive me for sins that i've committed and yeah. when i was in high school I had tons of tons of sins i was constantly on my bedside i'm praying for forgiveness <laughs> you're in high school <laughs> <laughs> but you the fundamental shift that's made there when you recognize when you go to confession with with, mm-hmm. with, a, with a priest who is is as we kept this belief in power to, to speak the words of Christ that Christ put into the lips and has the power to, to bind and loosen that very real sense and, mm-hmm. and say you are forgiven and that's Christ forgiving you like that is that's way more tangible that's that's it's physical you're, you're hearing things it's 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 a it's a a, a, a living experience that I, a back and forth versus just me praying and and trying to feel forgiven and you recognize in that moment like the difference you 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 mm-hmm. feel very viscerally like yes you know what? I was made for a faith that mm-hmm. is sacramental. Like mm-hmm. that that's hard to to put down on paper, right? It is. Unless you experience that or even for me to say like this, yeah. but th- that experience is so visceral and and it, it it really resonates with with your whole being and you go, "Yeah, you know what? This is how I was made mm-hmm. to operate." If we think of the faith as how we're, you know, how God is planned for how we're meant to operate as human beings, mm-hmm. like, you know, our, our proper operating instructions, then that you feel it, like mm-hmm. you feel it in the sacramental mm-hmm. experience, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think, you know, I think you're, you're using the right word there. Like it's something, it's, it's, it's not, you know, sacramentality is not just an idea. It's, it's an experience. It's, it is something felt like it, it addresses the whole human person. And it's meant to, so that like, for example, you're using that example of confession there. Well, sometimes, you know, I'm a priest, I hear them all the time. And, and I can tell you that I know sometimes people walk away wondering if they are forgiven. And I always tell them, well, 
But the words I gave, I absolve, that's Christ absolving you. Whether you feel it or not, even, you can trust that those words you've heard are Jesus's words to you through the priest. And so it, it can address everyone's needs at all times. Like sometimes you need that felt sense. And so it's there for you. Sometimes you're doubting or you're, you, you, you feel so overburdened by your own sinfulness that you can just trust at the very least. That you can trust those words have been spoken and I can trust in those words and so on and so forth. So that visceralness and it, it's why, you know, I mean, it's a bit cliche, but it's true. Catholicism is all about smells and bells because that's part of being human. Yeah. Again, like you, you go out for a nice dinner. You, you know, you put on some cologne or, you know, women will put on some perfume. You'll put, you know, you do up your hair. You, you, you That's part of being human. And it's why we dress up, right? And it's the same with liturgy. Like when a priest, he puts on all these vestments, all this stuff. It's saying what we're doing here is different. It's, it's, it's honorable and we need to, we need to honor that. And so all those things are meant to point us to the mystery that is always being made present to us each and every time. And that that mystery is present primarily, yes, in liturgy. But also, it's the mystery of your kids are sick at three o'clock in the morning. You're waking up to go, you know, they're sick in the bathroom, you know, and you got to go clean things up. That's the mystery of Christ's serving love, and it's of it's also crucifixion, I'm sure, you know. <laughs> um, but that's the mystery at play there, and it is visceral, but it is where Christ is all the time, and and that's the whole point. Everything, everything I do. Like literally everything is united to him. And there's and that when I allow that to get deeper into my heart, it allows me to live life a lot more joyfully and faithfully and fruitfully and, and more fulfilled. It also allows me to embrace suffering a lot more easily. Um all those things. It it really allows you to accept the whole gamut of human experience and feelings, et cetera. And to be able to enter into that confidently and say, Christ is here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's different in my mind than just trying to be a good Catholic or, or right. be, you know, it's a different, like you said, different air to breathe when mm -hmm. you're breathing the air of, okay, I am not just aspiring to this goal of, of getting to heaven or being a better Catholic mm -hmm. by imitating Christ and loving my neighbor and these things. Mm -hmm. I'm actually doing these things in, in Christ, participating yeah. In, yeah. in that life in, in a very real sense that, like you say, is, is closer than, than the actual physical surroundings that we find mm -hmm. ourselves in. We're, I think it was uh, Frank Sheed, I, I use this often, is the idea of, of God is closer to us than we would be in, if we're swimming in water. Like mm -hmm. the idea that, you know, you swim in water and, and water is, you can't describe how close it is because it's everywhere around you. It's, it's mm -hmm. it surrounds you. Right. Yeah. And, and, and Christ is, is that close to us. Um, but I suppose even closer. <laughs> I mean, we can't describe. Any, you know, any God is, that, I think right? it's St. Augustine. He says, um, God is closer to ourselves than we are to our inmost yeah. being. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the fact. And, and so, what that does then, and I think this is one of the reasons, and it's one of my hopes with the book in general, is to help – like, first, I think it, it what it's meant to do really is, A, actually to simplify life a bit. <laughs> you don't need to do all these 20 billion things to be a good Catholic. You just need to live the life that you've been called to faithfully because Christ is there. Also, then it gives you, like, this confidence to just really – allow Christ to work through things. Like I, I was saying to a friend the other day, how um, I've said that, you know, hope of the theological virtues, hope is probably the easiest one for me. You know, when we were shut down last year, I, I even got like kind of depressed, you know, and I couldn't, you know, there's not much to do every day. And, and, and as a priest, you live to do sacramental life for your people, et cetera. And it, it just, it kind of, you know, your life kind of gets a little dull for a bit. And, but I knew Christ was there. <laughs> And I knew he was working through this. And in a deep way, I, I even looking back, especially, I'm like, yeah, I, I, I found him there. Or like just last week at Mass, I was kind of meditating. Like it was a very busy, busy few weeks. And just during Mass, I'm just like, man, Jesus, like tired, et cetera. He goes, there was like this deep insight into the fact of, yep, but I'm there. And like it was a deep sense, real sense that he is there. And that he's working this. So, so it, it also kind of removes this kind of, I'm trying, I don't want to offend people with it, but like this flowery pietism 
that's like, oh, yes, Jesus isn't this. And this. I'm like, yeah, no, no. Like when you're suffering, he's there, but it's not going to make you feel any better. And it's not supposed to, <laughs> but it gives you the confidence to endure it because he's there with you. And it's not some image that he places in your mind. It's something deeper and something more spiritual and therefore more real. And it gives you that confidence to just move on. And I, like, I've been praying with that experience at mass a couple weeks ago, like constantly because it just hasn't left me. I'm like, wow, what a grace that was, you know, just like one of these moments. Like I'm just tired. He's like, yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the cross. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, okay. I could. Okay. Let's continue on. And, and so it gives you this confidence just to embrace life. And I think that's the other heart of sacramentality is really just say, like, stop running away from the world. In, and that, by that, I don't mean like the world in its sinful fallen sense, but rather like stop running away from life. You actually should run towards it because that's where God's found. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that. I love that so much. Let's talk about the church for a minute because yes. the, the church gives us, you know, all all these, I mean, there, there are, seven sacraments, right? But mm -hmm. there's so much there's so much more than that in terms of mm -hmm. the, the worldview that the, the, the and the ways the church helps us to enter into mm -hmm. this this mystery. So what can we say about in particular how how the church helps us to to live in this sacramental worldview? Like what, what Yeah, so we I put a couple chapters, I think I put two chapters in the on the church in there on purpose. Um and in part because and and actually it's interesting just stepping back a little bit is one of the things I've found a lot sometimes in Catholic circles where we've been trying, you know, there's a lot of talks about a new evangelization and all this stuff, which is all good. We got to be missional, all this jazz, like very good stuff. Absolutely. But I, and again, I don't want to offend people, but I found we were doing it in a Protestant way and not from this sacramental ethos, which is vastly different. So you would read programs about like how you go to program and you'd see stuff like, you know, this is where you are. This is how you're a sinner. This is how Jesus saves you. Oh, and then here's the sacraments. And like, it felt like it was just like a square peg in a round, in a round hole. It just didn't fit. And again, it's not to say that these are bad or anything. I just, but some in my mind, the way my mind often works, I'm like, there's something not fitting here. And if we, until we actually understand where this fits, like that's why we're not still evangelizing a lot because we actually haven't done it from the heart of what the, what faith is. And for me, it was, it was ignoring the church as being close to Christ. You can't know Christ without the church because the church is Christ's body. This is, um, this is Paul's constant refrain. I mean, it's, it's, it's perhaps one of his most powerful, uh, expressions of ecclesiology in the new testament when he talks about the church as a body and he doesn't just talk about it in corinthians he talks about it elsewhere as well and what he does with this is to i it's not to have a perfect identification of christ with the church in that the church is christ because if that happens that can lead to a lot of triumphalism <laughs> that isn't healthy and it loses the sense that we as members are sinners um but what it, it's meant to say, like, so it's why I love this line from the Second Vatican Council. And really, I, and much of this book is really, this is Vatican II theology. I didn't try not to do it too out, 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 out there, but it's just that this is, whole book comes from that. And uh, Lumen Gentium in Vatican says, the church is the universal sacrament of salvation. It's one of my favorite lines. <laughs> it's like when you think about that, you think about maybe that that older definition of sacrament, a visible sign that communicates an invisible, that makes present an invisible reality and communicates grace. It's true. It's true. Um, so what's if the church is that, well, what's the visible sign? Us, right? Uh, the, I actually just preached on it this weekend. The, the, the catechism has this great quote. It says, the church, the communion of saints is the church right so it's christ is the bond for it all and we in participating in christ's life now make christ present to the world and by making him present to the world we make grace effective which saves right so this is the whole mission and so you can't have christ without the church it is impossible it's absolutely impossible because baptism unites us to this church and we would argue obviously as catholics that the in the in the catholic church is the fullness of what the church is meant to be um and so faith is given to us by baptism through the church. It's, it's Christ's way in history, in time and space, to make himself present to us. 
so that what happened 2,000 years ago is always encounterable today. It also, this is part of being human again. We need places to go to, like particular church buildings. We need we need a local bishop to be the bond of communion to lead us, who is kind of Christ's vicar locally for us. We need a pope to kind of help unify the world's bishops together, et cetera. We need these things. We need, And we even need, and this is the hard part for you, we even need the institutional element because it's part of being human. <laughs> when you're organizing 1.3 billion people, you need paperwork. And, and it's actually, just a quick aside, like for me as a priest, that's actually something I've actually started to see paperwork in a bit of a sacramental lens <laughs> because it's part of ordering the lives of people yeah. for the for their good. So yeah, the marriage paperwork, yeah, sometimes it's a pain, but it actually is super helpful for the couple. It's super helpful for the priest to get to know them. And it's it's ensuring that everyone's free, for example. So this is all ordered to making Christ present. And that's, again, being a part of a body of people is part of being human. And so God will call us to this. So, you know, so the whole two chapters on the church really are there to try and refocus people to see you can't have faith. Like, again, God works through things, so you can't have faith without the church. It's impossible because you need an intermediary to make, to give us faith, and that's the church for the Christian. I think there's a lot of things that I think of in there, but one of those things is, the experience I experienced that we had as a as a family during yeah. one of the COVID lockdowns, uh, we had a friend on Facebook kind of write like, "Oh, I don't think churches." And this was a this is a, a, a believing a, a Christian friend, yeah. not 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 a Catholic friend, not a mm -hmm. someone in sacramental worldview. But they yeah. wrote an article kind of about you know I think that churches or why are people up in arms that churches are closed? She didn't understand why churches were why people cared so much that churches were closed because she kind of expressed the view that well you can you can worship anywhere you can meet online and worship in the same way you can do that mm -hmm. in person. And I think my my wife probably wrote back something I don't think I did, but I think she wrote back and said actually you know what as as, as Catholics this is a bit different. Mm -hmm. and kind of unpacked how how we felt and mm -hmm. how hard it was when churches mm -hmm. were closed because yeah. our our faith is tangible, it is sacramental, and being split apart from that was mm -hmm. was more challenging. And so we we had a lot of friends who locally when our Catholic churches opened up again here, they opened up first of all the churches mm -hmm. around. They, they opened the doors first, and the Orthodox churches did, did the same thing because you know the sacraments are tangible. We need to go to church mm -hmm. to receive the sacraments, and people couldn't understand. Couldn't understand that. They're like, "Oh, your church is already open. Like, it, it was the first weekend they could open. They're already open. Like, they aren't. They aren't being cautious, or right? There's there's some pushback, but it's a, a different ethos, like a different yeah. air you breathe, right? When you recognize the centrality of of the church in that sacramental worldview and and in the distribution of, of helping you live yeah. the sacraments, right? It's it's a very different perspective. Well, and for us, liturgy really is. Like I always say to people, if you're bored at mass, I, I have bad news for you about heaven. <laughs> like, <laughs> because this is heaven. This is the whole point here. Um, it, it's it is different for us, and and, and I think and it's it's. I, I wrote a, another little book a couple years ago, a year and a half ago with the pandemic, like called "Finding Christ in the Crisis." Like, and this was the whole point of it, just to say, like, you know, there's a there's a twofold thing to this. One, the one hand, we are, we are, we're not there, and this is not. The first time this has happened in the church, and it's not going to be like people in the Ukraine right now. They can't go to their churches. They were on lockdown all weekend for for what's going on there, uh, and rightfully so. Like you got you got to be. There are times where things kind of interrupt this, but at the same time, we need to to nurture this. It, so just quickly, like on that, actually, it's interesting because I started off doing a lot of stuff. I did like the streaming and everything. I look back. Now, I wish I never did streaming. I wish I never did streaming. I, I I think what it would have, and I had a friend who was praying liturgy the hours with his family every Sunday. Like I said, what a great idea. And I think like looking back, and it's not this like, or if I was to stream stuff, it would just be like the homily or something like that. I don't need to stream the whole mass because I've heard from some people, maybe of an older generation, it's like, oh, I, it doesn't matter. I can watch mass at church or I can watch it at, at home. I'm like, well, no, you don't. You, you, you don't watch. <laughs> You don't watch, but again, it's it's also it's how things were formed for a long time. So it, it, again, it didn't form in that participation thing. But rather, I think what would have you know, looking back, I, hindsight's twenty twenty, is we would have been better off like doing a, you know, teaching people how to pray at home, 
because yes, there is a truth that you can worship anywhere. Absolutely you can. But also when we go to mass, we're not, I always like to say this, we don't go to worship. <laughs> we go to be lifted up into Christ's worship because we cannot worship perfectly. Only Christ can. Um, and so we go to be lifted up into his perfect act of love to the father. And when, so that's really important. So one thing I did is we streamed, but then people would park in our parking lot and they'd watch it on their phones or whatever. So the only thing that's separating them is one wall. Yeah. And then I would distribute communion after mass because I also wanted to connect the Eucharist with the mass and not just, you just can receive the Eucharist whenever you want. You're not, it's really is meant to be connected to the mass. That's one thing I did. Um, but exactly because like the whole idea is there is this notion of coming to a particular place. Uh, we go to the hockey rinks to, to watch hockey games. You have to go there to really get into the full experience of things. You can, we all know watching a hockey game at home is not the same as going to watch the Canucks live or whatever, right? That it, it's, it's a very different experience because it's meant to be, because there's something about that tangible being there in person is so vital to being human that to lose it would be to lose your humanity. And so having these places to gather is is vital it's it's god acknowledged and and the church did it from her first days <laughs> yeah i mean in the early early days it was they would go to the synagogue to hear the scriptures and then they would go to someone's house to celebrate the eucharist right much smaller in the f very first days of the church they didn't have proper church buildings but it developed over time and but always they went to a place for the eucharist it wasn't just let's just they had to gather together it was, and even actually in the early, early church, the bishop was pretty much the main celebrant in each town. And that was it. There weren't all these different churches. There was one church per town and everyone went there and, and, you know, things change, but that idea of coming together, it, like those experiences are vital to being human and the church. So it's interesting that that logic was just there from the beginning and it grew out of Israel. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that that, that idea too of uh, you know connecting the the streaming to the actual in per like delivering mm -hmm. the Eucharist like to the you know to the to the mm -hmm. car like that that because that that makes that beautiful connection. I I think too of I mean you you mentioned a bit earlier the idea of evangelization and and the, these programs that kind of miss sometimes the mark and I I think how better serve the church would be if we evangelize with the sacraments, right? If that's what we hold out as the thing that, that draws people in. So I think it, I think it would, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's the thing that I'm, I'm thinking again of the early church, right? Who were, who were can, people confused met with cannibals because they didn't know what they were, what they were doing. Like there's, right. there's a power of the sacraments yeah. that, that draws people in or, or makes them wonder what's going on in there. Yeah. Uh, right. Holding that out, as a thing to draw people in, I think is so powerful because that's the life of the church, right? Yeah, and and I mean, you even in the New Testament, you see it. It's the 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 good news is preached, and then it's get baptized, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not all right now. You have faith. No, no, no. You get baptized because faith comes through baptism. Like so, baptism was always from the beginning the entry point to faith, because faith in the end is not some subjective act. That's belief. No, faith is a gift given to us by God, and so they preaching was always tied to this always and it's it's interesting i think that's why like with the rca process in the church um i think that's the heart of this idea of this renewal around this um at least for non-baptized it's yeah we're going to preach the gospel to you because it's meant to lead to baptism and so preaching and sacrament come together because word and sacrament are always meant to go hand in hand right and i think you know there is a truth that for Catholics, perhaps the sacramentality neglected word sometimes, right? Um, while for Protestantism, it's word almost yeah. to the total ignorance of sacrament. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there is a mutual learning there that I think can be a real grace to each other. But, and then, you know, someone like Rasmus would say, well, no, it's all word <laughs> because it's Jesus who is the <laughs> word, right? Um, but this is we need the 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 preaching is always meant to lead to an encounter with God through something tangible in particular, always starting with baptism. Um, and, and even in popular culture, I mean, I think the I would actually I would say the the most common sacrament that people would associate with Catholicism in popular culture besides baptism is confession, right? It's yeah. probably the most dram dramatized. Um, 
sacrament in film and television. Because there is something really beautifully dramatic about this one-on-one -on -one encounter in the midst of a confessional in a darkened room with some old priest who can barely keep his eyes open or whatever, you know, it's just like all it, there's something very like, I mean, one of the films I, I think about often, I love someone was asking the other day, what are some good films with confession in it? And uh, one's hail Caesar. I love that. Uh, um, then there's um, Calvary from, from the Irish film, which is amazing. But the one I always think about the most is I confess by Alfred Hitchcock which all plays around this whole idea of the um, plays around the idea of the uh, um, the seal of the confessional yeah. that the priest can't reveal what he's heard. And the whole film is really about the psychological guilt, the penitent feels about the murder he's committed. And he's afraid that the priest is going to rat him out as he's framing the priest that he would, the priest was the one who did the murder. Um, it's a psychological thriller, but it's like, man, what, <laughs> But only Catholicism can do that, and <laughs> everyone finds that fascinating and intriguing. And it draw. And even when I go talk to kids, I say, when I'm preparing them for confession, I say, when you come see me, I can't tell anybody. I can't tell your parents anything you said to me. Um, so you you can feel comfortable to say because it's really about I'm just an intermediary for Jesus. And then they love to play the games. Well, you can't. What about if I said this or what if I said that? And I'm like, I can't. I can't tell anyone. And they're just amazed by it. It intrigued. And you're right. So then it draws in. It grabs the attention that, wait, there's something that someone recognizes is so important that no matter what's said to them, he'll never say anything because he would be ex I would be excommunicated if I said anything. And, and there's something really. So you're right. Evangelization should go hand in hand with this. I, I think um, this might be the time to bring it up. I don't know. I hope I'm not like jumping the gun on this. But I think there's also that obstacle there of modernism, right? This and I think this is the big obstacle. It is it is um, it is the obstacle actually, in my opinion, um, because it's why we can't connect Jesus and sac, uh, you know, uh, good news and sacrament, evangelization and sacrament, because we actually don't know. We actually can't accept the idea that God works through things. Yeah, well, tell us more. I was going to ask you next. I was, <laughs> okay. was going to ask you next about the obstacle of modernism because you, you yes. mentioned that in, in the book, and it's so fascinating that, it, that there is this kind of giant roadblock there. So unpack that a bit more for, for us. Yeah, we'll walk right into that. Perfect. Good, good, perfect, perfect. Um, uh, and I'll say this is one of my favorite chapters to write, um, and, and it's been really interesting hearing from some people who've read the book. Like I gave it to my secretary, and when she read that chapter, she goes. I understand why my brother and my son and all these people have this hesitancy towards faith now. And and she's not, you know, she's, um, n you know, nothing, no, no theological education or anything, but it was just, it was a light bulb moment for her. she goes, I understand it now. I didn't, I was always wondering why I couldn't tell them about the faith. Now I don't know what the obstacle is. So modernism. So it's a word as we know as Catholics is thrown around a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and often in a misunderstood way. And my theology prof in seminary defined it in this very pithy way that I've never forgotten. He says it's the denial of mediation. Mediation is this idea that God works through things. So modernism is this idea that at best, at best, God exists. But he doesn't work in his world. The problem with that, you know, if God doesn't work in the world, though, everything about Christianity falls apart because the sacraments aren't effective. They're just nice symbols that actually don't mean anything, that are just given a meaning. But even that meaning is meaningless because God couldn't have come into the world in Jesus Christ. God couldn't have saved us. God couldn't have created us. We didn't actually sin because there's, you know, there's no real way to actually have a relationship with God to sin against him. Miracles can't happen. Like everything about Christianity falls apart when you deny the idea that God can work in the world. The scriptures are just man-made, right? All this stuff over and over again, it's 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 the problem. And you see that a lot. Like, so you mentioned that example for uh, of your Protestant friend who said, well, we can just worship God anywhere. Yes, there's a truth to this. Um, but you can't be lifted up into God's worship anywhere yet. That's what mass is for. Um, that we deny this idea that we have to go through something to find God. So another example of it, just kind of piggybacking on the idea of confession. Um, and actually, you mentioned it earlier. I don't need to go to confession. I can just talk directly to God. And we deny that there that God has chosen to work in this way. And we have a real rebellion against this. This idea, because what if God works through things, 
then it actually places, I think, often a kind of accountability on us. There is something more, there's a more tangible accountability on us to, there's a more tangible accountability on us to actually seek God and to actually live by his teachings. Because if God is in this ethereal distance, um, then he has no bearing on my life, right? The further God is away, it's true, yes. And it's why I think faith is actually, it's another reason I think faith is so hard today. If God is experienced as very distant because the ideology we're raised in in modernism is this idea that actually mediation doesn't work. It doesn't happen. Everything's direct. And that's, that is, I would argue, one of the major cultural obstacles and ideological obstacles that most people don't even recognize their con. We, we, we participate in is one of the most it is one of the biggest obstacles we have to overcome and it's a it's a hard one that I keep on racking my brain out over how do you overcome this <laughs> yeah like the idea the idea that I don't need to go to a certain place to worship God right I can, yeah I can do that wherever or I can use any means I I think of the very modern idea that I that I heard a while back I can't remember where it, it came from but it was a it was a uh, I don't think I was I, I was the, I was becoming Catholic. I wasn't quite Catholic yet, I don't think, but I was listening to a Protestant pastor unpack John six, which of course for us Catholics is the idea that Christ is establishing the Eucharist and giving us his body and, and blood to, to quite literally con- consume in, in the Eucharist. And this pastor unpacked it as, well, you know it's it's it, it's it's symbolic and doesn't matter. It, the, it was quite an interesting exegesis actually <laughs> ended up being doesn't really matter and you can do communion with anything and and anywhere. And he goes, look, I have I have this bag of chips and this this can of coke. I can make this communion, and I can that can be the symbols for me, and I can do this by myself in this room, and that's meaningful. Mm-hmm. And even back then, it struck me as very strange. Like it's that's yeah. a really, I think, modernist take on that. Like you're really yeah. bringing yourself to that piece of scripture and saying, well, it says this, but I can just do do it this way, and this is just as meaningful, right? It's it's imposing meaning instead of receiving meaning, yeah, right? Yeah. And and for us as Catholics, revelation is God is the main actor of which we have to humbly receive and yeah, be obedient to. Yeah. And again, so that's part of the modernist ideal is this idea that I, I am the determiner of my own ideas and I am the determiner of my own worldview and I make up my own worldview and I can make up my own meaning. And, and so we don't, we don't have this receptivity towards reality, towards our own experience and towards God that pushes them off to distance. And so like, it's funny cause like, um, it's always funny when they never says, well, I can worship God anywhere. They never do, yeah. uh, by the way. They never do. They say it because they it's actually often the excuse to actually not worship God. Um, um, but the all of this, all these this ideology, all it does is actually pushes the God who is present and active further and further away. And even like I would even say for Catholics, because I don't want to just be seen as like uh, <laughs> banging on Protestantism here. <laughs> I think a lot of Catholics, even in the way they approach the sacraments, yeah, yeah, often yeah. is in a modernist fashion of like, like especially so my big one is actually often the Eucharist. It, it's it's treated in an almost sometimes it can be treated in an almost magical sense, like and in a, in a it loses its sacramental character and it becomes a literalism. And I'm like, well, then if what you're saying about the Eucharist is true, it does become that we are cannibals because we are gnawing on his flesh then. No, no, we're receiving in a sacramental way the whole person of Jesus. That's the Catholic um, That's the Catholic position. Um, it's not this like physicalist, oh, you know, I'm gnawing on Jesus' hand or arm or whatever. It, it, and so a lot of Catholics, they kind of approach it in this kind of magical and almost literalist sense to fight against the symbolist idea and fair enough but it, it can become this reactionism and it's all out of this modernism uh because how we approach the physical world and everything and how we see it um and i think it, it it's it goes way back i did not put this in the book but modernism really finds its roots in its in at least in an explosive manner in the protestant reformation yeah. Luther is the first guy to really put this in a popular way. Um, it comes earlier in philosophy and theology. I won't bore people with this around like nominalism and all this jazz, which of which Luther was a student of. But and it's also the fruit, I think, of the church's sinfulness at the time 
and, and, and of, of her brokenness and her lack of communion. And there was a loss of a sense of stability at the time. And so Luther needed this need of, I need some sort of guarantee because the church seems to have lost its ability to be that guarantee. You have, you have, you have popes and you have anti-popes and the, and they're fighting about who's actually the real Pope. That is a real crisis of faith and identity and certainty of salvation. And when the church loses her ability to be that sureness of salvation, it's going to find its way elsewhere. And I think that's what Luther was looking for because of the sinfulness of the church. So there's a lot of stuff behind it, but because it goes back so far, it's really hard to just wean out. And I think sometimes the best way is experientially, really. It's just about throwing yourself into the life of the church and the faith, like experiencing what she has to offer liturgically and sacramentally in the life of virtue and the life of devotions uh, and life of the sacraments, everything uh, in the life of your own acts of charity. You throw yourself into that and it starts to make more and more sense. And it starts to chip away at that modernism. Cause I don't know if there's a way to argue people out of it. Cause it's something so deep in our experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's one thing I think to, to meet God on your terms and other yeah. things to meet God on his terms. So to come, yeah. you know, to come and begin to live out that sacramental worldview and see the fruits of that, right? Yeah. Versus meeting, you know, bringing God to you and living out your yeah. faith how, how you want God to look. I mean, which is, yeah, really what Luther kind of began to unpack there in reaction to what was happening at the time, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so um, what you just said actually just made me think of something so Pascal's wager, right? His whole wager is not about an it's not an intellectual exercise. Be saying that the best bet to make is to live as if God exists. Yeah, yeah. Because his idea is that if you live as if God exists and that's the most reasonable way to live, you're going to know he exists because you're living for him. You're going to experience through that lived life of faith by giving yourself over to God in that way, you're going to actually experience the reality of God. And so his argument is not really meant to be an intellectual exercise it's actually meant to be an existential or lived way of being. And I think we could do ourselves a lot of favor by kind of bringing that back in. Just live, live as if God exists, live. And, and, and you will see it's true. <laughs> yeah. You will see it's true. <laughs> Absolutely. I think some of the best advice I've ever, I've ever received and how yeah. to say raise your kids Catholic or how to evangelize as a Catholic, these mm -hmm. things is to live, like, like yeah. live that, like, like live the sacramental life, live the liturgical life, live the, yeah. the church year out fully, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do be a Catholic, <laughs> right? yeah. like, really be it and mean it. And, and that's going to, you know, your, your kids will see that and they will, they will, they will follow you. Your friends will see that and they will be attracted to it. I mean, like, it's not magic. It's just living as a Catholic and accepting. Exactly. Right? Exactly yeah. What, what that means. And so it, it's interesting because, again, it's and I, it's not their fault because I think it's just how things were formed at the time. But, you know, you talk to an older generation, they'll say, oh, none of my kids go to church anymore. Yeah. And I'll ask them, well, what did you do raising them in the faith? Well, I sent them to Catholic school. Yeah. O okay. And what do you mean, and? <laughs> we went to Mass every Sunday. Yeah. O okay. And? Well, that's it. Like, that's what we we're supposed to do. And so I think that's how they were formed. Like, it, it's, there's a lot of reasons why I think people were formed that way, and and and, and, for, and unfortunately they are victims of this. But well, it's like if you're not praying at home every day, like it, one of my hardest things as a priest when I talk to people, like tell me about, especially when they're devout Catholics. Well, tell me about their uh, prayer life at home. Yeah. Oh, they, I never saw them. If they prayed at home, it was privately in a way. You know, it was never. It was. It didn't. It, it didn't become the heartbeat of their life. It became an add-on or a thing you're supposed to do to be a good person in life and again i think that's how things are formed so i don't it's not completely their fault but it, like it breaks my heart because i'm like you're right like i always say to people like, this is not, actually not hard this is I, pray with your family <laughs> and make sure you have time for private prayer as parents so that you're, but make sure that your kids can see it and they know that hey this is where mom and dad like that it's this part of life. You go to mass. You you hang out with people from the church. You participate in church activities. One of the one of the things we're doing in our parish right now is we're trying to do monthly solemn vespers, and it's been a huge success. And families are bringing their kids, and the kids experience chant music and all this stuff, and they don't see it as weird, or and they don't they're not screaming and saying get us out of here, <laughs> because the parents live their faith at home. They talk about Jesus with their kids. Like, and if you do that, like you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine. Like it's not. This is not this hard thing. Um, just a let 
let what the church has be lived out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's no secret formula. There's there, there's no Gnostic no. secret formula to becoming, to, you know, to, to evangelizing or raising your kids. Like yeah, it's, exactly. It's 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 meant to be straightforward. I can remember this this haunts me to this day. I, when I became Catholic through the RCA process, I it, we had Easter vigil and and it was yeah it was it was amazing. And the the parish that I had uh, I done the program with was just the closest one to our house. I was so naive. I mm-hmm. thought that they're all the, all the same because they're, they're all Catholic churches. I thought oh they're all the same. I'll just do this one here. Mm-hmm. I didn't really quite realize. What getting into and it was quite a funny little program that they, they ran there but I went through it and I, and, I, and I loved the experience and I became Catholic and I began going to, to daily mass uh, mm-hmm. before we had kids I went to daily mass and then I went to, so I went to the gym first and mm-hmm. then daily mass and then to work and it was this amazing schedule I, that part of my life was just I, I, I love that schedule because um, it was just it was so enriching and our kids are also enriching so i shouldn't disparage mm-hmm. <laughs> disparage them but i i after mass w- one day the the priest who had you know who had confirmed me and given me my first eucharist in the church he was there quite an older guy you know formed formed in that time when formation wasn't wasn't fantastic and pulled me aside and said you know i'm so glad that you're here because everyone does the program and then i never ever see them again they become catholic mm. and i never see them ever again they just mm. and i thought like I, I, I smiled and I nodded and I left and just sat in my car thinking like, that's terrible. This, this, this priest, you know, sees these, these new Catholics go through the program and then never ever sees them again. Like mm-hmm. how that, that's such a, and that, that that's, was just the norm, right? And, and I, was, yeah. I was abnormal coming back to mass over and over again. And I thought like, that's, that, <laughs> that's, not, that's not right, right? So, you no, know, it's not. And this is why, my, I, I don't know. This is my intuition. I think in parish life, um, the way to renewal is through um, young adults and young fa- and families. Because if you're bringing your kids to church nowadays, my experience is as a pastor, at least, a, at least this is my experience in my diocese. If you're coming, if you got kids, you're coming to church. You're doing this because this is the heart of your identity. <laughs> you're not coming because it's what you're supposed to do on Sunday. It's very rare you encounter that anymore. Because, like, so I have a young adult group in my parish, and they're all they're helping with the altar servers. They are uh, helping with music. They are helping with all sorts of different things, and people are seeing it. And they're seeing these young people who don't just come to mass. They come to daily mass. They'll go to confession. They will help out with liturgy stuff. They're willing to help out with different projects around the parish. And it shows, and they're like, wait, what's going on? I'm like, oh no, for them, being Catholic is a 24 seven thing. It's they're Catholic when they go to school. They're Catholic when they eat. They're Catholic when they sleep and, and they want to do things around the parish. And I think when people witness that, it starts to propose a question to, to them when who just come to mass every Sunday and throw their five dollars in the collection basket and that's their they've done their duty or whatever. It starts to propose a question. Wait, is there something more? And I think so. I find like our generation maybe um, there is that intensity of life that just wants to live this that I think can actually be a great rejuvenating um, force in the church and in the parish. Yeah, yeah. It's that discipleship versus yeah. the the nominal. You know, I, I'm I'm Catholic versus I'm a Catholic disciple. Maybe is is one yeah. way of, of. I know you said such such in the book on this too, near the end. But it, that's it's different, right? And 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 I think I, I totally agree with you, Father. How many people do we encounter who who are Catholic, who are are Catholic in in name or or you know or or origin kind of mm-hmm. only? And I think in my own experience of becoming Catholic, I met so many kind of nominal Catholics, right? I always mm-hmm. joked that I was in the punk rock scene in high school and all the all the guys that I knew from the Catholic school would come in their uniforms after school and they had the best drugs or they had the flask <laughs> in their in their in their you know so in their when, when uh, Catholics sin, Catholic they know how to yeah. sin, okay? Yeah, right. We know how to sin. We got confession. We know how to sin, okay? <laughs> yeah, right. But that was my encounter for a long time yeah. of Catholics, what what this, these kind of caricatures of these of these Catholic yeah. kids. Right, but how how different would that be if we begin to live out that sacramental worldview in a really in a serious way, and then when when somebody who's not a Catholic encounters that Catholic who's living who's breathing that different oxygen, that looks different. That that draws people in. Right, mm-hmm. that's a different experience than meeting somebody on the street or, or becoming a friend of somebody who's a, who's a Catholic kind of in in origin or in, in name only. Right, mm-hmm. exactly, and and. It's different because, and I think this is at the heart of sacramentality in the end, it's different because it's also so normal, <laughs> right? Uh, this is the heart. It, it, when God took on our flesh, 
he took on a human he took he, or a human family took him in in Mary and Joseph and he learned to crawl and to walk eat and sleep uh he played games probably with friends he learned he probably learned carpentry at the uh, with St Joseph he helped around the house did chores all these things and God was there in the most mundane things yeah and for the catholic that's the thing that's the that's the catholic difference is god takes on even the most mundane things and imbues them with his presence to make them into something infinite and that's the heart of sacramentality really it says god takes all of this on through your baptism when you're just sitting there playing a game with your kids or you know just sitting in front of the fire with your wife or whatever it might be it doesn't have to be anything even super special or you know you're even in your frustration as the kids won't eat their dinner god's there <laughs> and when you embrace that and accept that and then let it just and receive it as a gift that sets you apart because the mundane isn't to be avoided it's to be embraced because even there god is there and that i think is what sets catholic people apart that can attract in the end wait you have all these kids and it's not a pain for you and it's not something terrifying for you it's like no it's hard yep it is hard and you know i know lots of catholic families it's like they're not against any of the church's teachings, but they're like, man, it is hard doing this sometimes. <laughs> and I get that, right? Um, when you have your sixth kid or your seventh kid, sometimes it's like for for those who have like larger families, it's a lot. It is, and it, I totally I'm, like, especially when you go visit, you're like, oh, thank God I'm a priest. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, <laughs> you know. But it's just this is it's just, but that's just the reality of life. But it, it's but God's there, and my job as a priest is to help them remember that and to bring God there, and 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 people see that and they see the difference and so what's really beautiful is that like it is even in the early church they went to work just like everyone else they did everything and this is at the heart of like gets back to our question around evangelization at the heart of second vatican council is to say yeah when you're in a cubicle next to your guy that's where you evangelize as laity. Like it's not the priest, it's the lady. they're there you're a christ you are you are the church's presence in that place and thank God for that. So let that difference shine forth for doing the exact same job that everyone else is doing. You know, um, that's the Catholic secret. I think sometimes we we try to idealize it, make it this big thing. It's like no, no, no. It's the vocation you've been given is the place where God is, and it's where He can be found. So just embrace Him there. <laughs> That's fantastic. There's tons of unpacking here. This is, I, I think, just a great place to, to end because, I mean, we could go on for hours and hours, I think. So this, <laughs> this, is, this is wonderful. That's a that's a great thought to just sit in and, and let that marinate. This has been mm -hmm. this has been a lot of fun, Father yeah. Mars, and I appreciate your time no problem. coming on great. here. Uh, um, can you tell people uh, where they can hear more hear more of you? They can do mm -hmm. that actually, yeah. and and find this book and, and follow you and those kinds of things. Where, where yeah, can they, so where can they go? Um, you can find me on Twitter at fr harrison. I'm like you said earlier. I'm the co-host of Clerically Speaking, which comes out um, pretty much every week. Uh, the book is so if you're in Canada, we're working, we're trying. It's, it's you can't really force it. It's, it's not available on Amazon.ca <laughs> still, which is a, as you know in Canada. Shipping is crazy and stupid expensive, unless you have order from Amazon, which is always free. So it's like, I'm tr we're trying to get it on Amazon. Let's say we can go to Pauline bookstores uh, in the States or in Canada and order directly from the sisters. Then it's hand wrapped by them and everything. And they they always pray for every person they're packaging books for, which is a nice little extra treat. So you can get it there. You can, if you're not in Canada, you're in the States, you can also get it on Amazon, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I think that's I think that's and, and and also just keep your eyes open. I don't know the exact date yet, but there will be a, a video series coming out for the book as well in the next month or so uh, to help facilitate. Uh, and it's going to be free. Like the idea is, parishes can get the videos for free. You just order enough copies of a book for your class, and then people can just we I, we parish programs always charge too much. The idea is no, just get it out there and help people. Mm -hmm learn and so the, that should be coming out in the next month or so uh to help facilitate that so 
Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. And I kind of watched you behind the scenes, uh, you know, filming that. Uh, you know, sisters were posting different pictures of it. You, you it was a lot of fun. It was. It looks like it's going to be amazing. It was the best ten days of my life. Yeah, I, awesome. I, just quickly, I was uh, I was talking to the bishop just when I got back, and he goes, "Have you taken any holidays yet this year?" I'm like, "Well, I just got ten days so far." I went. I was. In, he goes, "What'd you do?" I said, "I went to Boston, and I did this video sis- series, and I spent the ten days with these sisters." He goes. You spent your holiday with nuns? I would hate to do that. I said, Bishop, it was the best 10 days of my life. And it really it really was the best 10 days of my life. It was a lot of work, but it was also, again, sharing that charism was a real gift. And to learn the beauty, like for me, it's something I, just quickly, like I, it's why I have the Marian stance chapter in the church, in the book and everything too. There was a real gift of the women into church. And, and I really experienced that with the sisters, uh, their creativity uh, their vision, uh, their love of the gospel, and their charism. It's something I'll never forget. Do you want to be a nun now, Father? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I still get to do the sacraments and everything, so yeah, okay. I, I kind of like that. I kind of like that. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Father Harrison, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. I, I want to say God bless you and your and your ministry, your work as a, as a priest, of course, and this, this book and the fantastic things you're doing for the church. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. And thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, take care.